Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. serial entrepreneur who founded Fulcrum Venture Accelerator in 2019 and most recently founded Kandara with a mission to empower women everywhere through body literacy. Please welcome the founder of Kandara, Will Sachs. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with Will Sachs. Will, how are we doing? Doing good. Yeah, I was telling you, I'm fasting right now, so yep. you got me in a very pointed energy, which is great. Man, it's why, why, why fasting? May I ask? You know, I like to do it once every quarter or once every year. It's just a way to like clear out the system. Um, it also really focuses my uh, my energy and my attention in an interesting way that I like. It, it, it's like my BS meter. My, my tolerance for BS goes way down is what I notice. And so the, the own BS that I'm selling myself becomes more apparent when other people are, are not aligned, that becomes more apparent. So I just like it. I think it's a, a great practice that everybody could benefit from. No, it makes sense. Yeah. It's kind of, you have to really start to focus, but enough about fasting first, who is Will Sachs? Let's go ahead and give the listeners at home a little bio. Sure. Uh, so I was born in Toronto in the 80s uh, and went to school in Montreal. I went to McGill and studied engineering and economics. And while I was at school, I met these other folks, these other students who were building a solar powered race car. And so I immediately stopped going to my classes and started just working on the race car all the time. <laughs> and so we eventually built this solar powered race car. We raced it from Chicago to Los Angeles. Oh, and wow. That was like the first experience I had of building something, you know, creating something from a vision. We had to raise a bunch of money. I ended up raising a lot of that money. Um, so then graduated from McGill and started a lighting company with a friend of mine because I'm an environmentalist and we realized that energy efficient lighting is like the best investment that anybody can make anywhere. Um, it's like guaranteed hundreds of percent per year uh, returns. So we started a lighting company uh, and ran that for a couple of years. And then I eventually met my former partner, Katie, and uh, I sold my lighting company to my partner and started Kandara because I just got so excited about fertility charting and the the ability or the potential of what uh, tracking fertility data could do for couples who are trying to conceive or who are trying to avoid pregnancy um, or just understand their cycles. And then built Kandara for seven years and uh, we did the whole angel venture route and ended up selling it to a women's health company in 2018. Um, and by then I had moved to Boulder, Colorado. And, uh, and then a few years after we sold it, you know, I took a break. I went to Bali. I made music on the beach and stared at the ocean and recuperated. Um, and then I started the coaching. Dream, so I don't have to. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a nice time. Um, and then I started coaching entrepreneurs. You know, I started decided I wanted to get back into it and started coaching entrepreneurs. And that turned into Fulcrum, which is the accelerator that I run now. Uh, we're helping entrepreneurs raise money and learn that weird arcane skill of fundraising that nobody teaches you. Uh, and so that just started, that started as a first group program. And we've now run six cohorts as of May, 2023. And we're uh, enrolling our next cohort now by the time this airs. Uh, and we've helped about a hundred of our alumni founders raise about $40 million. Wow. And uh, all around companies that are doing something positive in the world, either in human health and well being, or um, technology related to climate change or culture. We just look for companies that have a positive social mission and that are at this, the pre seed seed stage. And then we help them close their next round. I love it. So now let's, let's, let's take a couple of steps back. Uh, for sure. the listeners, um, first, 
why the name Fulcrum? Uh, it's from my engineering background. So <laughs> a fulcrum, a lever is one of the elemental machines. I think, I can't remember how many there are. There's the screw and the lever and the pulley, I believe. But they're machines that magnify force. And to have a lever, you need a fulcrum. So I thought it was a great metaphor for what we do is we provide a, a stable point for our founders to magnify their force and, and their impact. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Now, now for the listeners that might not be familiar with an accelerator, what is it? Yeah. So entrepreneurship is hard. There, it, it's like, um, it's an exercise in chaos in a way. And for people who haven't done it before, it's kind of unlike anything else. And so accelerators exist to make it easier. And when I was building Kendara, we did two accelerators. We did Founder Institute and we did Hackcelerator, which was in China, um, a hardware accelerator in China. Um, and they both had a large material positive impact on our, our on our company and on my skill set as an entrepreneur. I met investors and other founders and mentors, people who could point me to the path. Uh, and yeah, so accelerators exist to help startups succeed. And there's like a million ways to do it wrong. And there's only a few ways to do it right. That's what I've learned after doing this for 15 years. And so if you can, you can partner with somebody to point you at the paths that go, you know, down the ravine into the mud puddle and don't go anywhere else. Uh, it's well worth it to have those paths pointed out to you so you can stay on the path that's going to take you where you want to go. Yeah, very, very well said. Now, you mentioned also you your team specifically looks at, um, you know, specific entrepreneurs and businesses. Who is the typical cohort member for your accelerator program? Typical cohort member is somebody is the CEO of a mission driven company who has raised a little, little bit of money, maybe a few hundred thousand dollars or a million, um, and is looking to raise a seed round of either a million, two million, up, up to four or five million. So it's somebody who's already been successful elsewhere in their life, and they've now gotten their business to a point they need to take that next step of bringing in more professional investors, and they just haven't done it before. So they don't really know how the world works, what to say, how to structure the round, how to go about raising the round. You know, it's a it's a weird thing that only people who go through it can see. You see all the details and how there's so many ways to do it wrong and only a few ways to do it right, um, like I said about entrepreneurship in general. And so we help founders who are already successful in other areas of life and just want to learn how to play the fundraising game efficiently and effectively get through that game successfully. So for, for the listeners that might be very unfamiliar, you know, with, with the seed round, it kind of explain it. So, so they're kind of familiar with what does this all mean? Yeah. Well, I'll talk about when I started Kandara. So I had a dream of being a venture funded CEO. I thought, how cool is it that I can have an idea, package it in such a way that it's compelling and go to these professional investors, venture capitalists, and show them what I want to build, show them my vision and have them fund it. It seemed so cool be because it's like, if I could do that, well, I could build anything I wanted. Like there's no more constraints at that point. If I wanted to build a rocket to the moon, you know, packaged in the right way, could get funded and now, you know, has been funded um, with SpaceX and everything. It's incredible. So that's what drew me to it is, wow, there's really a lot of power in being able to learn how to have other people support your ideas because then you no longer have any constraints on, on the financial side of things. Or so I thought. Um, and so that's what venture capital is. You know, It's professional investors who are taking a risk on risky ideas that have a large upside. And and so that's what that's what a seed round is. You're typically raising either from angels, which are individuals who are just wealthy and are investing their own money, or venture capitalists who are professional investors who are investing other people's money uh, in the context of a broader portfolio with the expectation that they're going to make a, an outsized return at the end of five or 10 or 12 years, which is the, the, the lifetime of your normal fund. 
Now, what 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 are some things entrepreneurs should be kind of aware of before going to the venture capital route? Yeah. So most businesses are not a fit for venture capital uh, because they they don't fit the criteria. So the criteria are it's got to be highly scalable, and it's got to be so which kind of rank uh, weeds out any service businesses. Um, it's, so it's mostly technology, media, and, and intellectual property. Hardware is often not funded because even hardware doesn't feel as scalable as as uh, software and in IP. So it's got to be very scalable and it's got to have a huge upside. So venture investors are typically looking for 100x or 1,000x or 10,000x. And so you've got to be able to make the case that the upside is big enough for the investors to invest in. And you actually have to go into it as the entrepreneur wanting to produce that level of upside, which is very different than going in and building like a two or a five or a $10 million company. And PS, if you build a $10 million company and you don't raise money, well, maybe you get to take home two of those 10 every year, which is, you know, a much higher percentage play than raising from venture capital and going for the $100 million moonshot. So that's something that entrepreneurs should know. You know, it's a it's a high risk, high reward path. Yeah, yeah, very true. Now, where would you say, do you see, you know, what is like the hardest part about the venture capital route for the entrepreneur? I think the hardest part is the asymmetry uh, in, in that the venture capital investors are doing this all day, every day for years. And the entrepreneur is doing this maybe if they're really successful, like 10 times in their career, in their entire career over like three decades. So I won't, I'm not going to say like you're swimming with sharks, but you're, you're bringing a knife to a gunfight that maybe that's a better idiom. Uh, so they, they're professionals. They do this all day long. They know exactly what they're looking for and they'll weed you out in a second. Whereas you're the, as the entrepreneur, you, you only building one company. This is your one company. You've got to get this round done if you want to go on and build what you want to build. And so there's a massive asymmetry there. Um, and that's part of what we do at Fulcrum and why I started it because we, we try to reduce the asymmetry by just training entrepreneurs on how this works, how to think about it, what to do, what's worked for others, what is sure not to work so they can avoid all those mistakes and find that path to success easier. Yeah. And I'm starting to see these like unique levels of entrepreneurship, right? There's, there's the entry level. You're just learning about marketing and branding and business plans, marketing plans, operation plans, right? You're just kind of learning about that stuff. Yeah. And then there's the second level right before the venture capital. Well, I think it's like, now you're learning about product development, business development, um, exit strategy, business planning, right? Strategy operations, financing, all those fun things. And then you're kind of determining, am I big enough to go or scale Like to your point? And it's interesting, you mentioned you're, you're fasting right now and you're, you basically, you cut out the BS, right? And you're kind of, that's exactly what venture capitalists essentially do. Now, what, what would you say, you know, outside of you know, the intellectual property, everybody's on the same playing field on intellect, let's just say generically, everybody's on the same playing field from an intellectual property perspective. What what things should entrepreneurs be doing right during that presentation phase, right? They have the, the venture capitalist in front of them. What are some tactics that they should be thinking about doing to kind of help them get the leg up? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to give you the gold here. This is this is the this is the most important thing that we teach in Fulcrum. I say it everywhere. I want every entrepreneur to know this. Um, the most important thing is the process that you run when you raise money. If you can get 10 different investors interested at the same time on the same day, you're very likely to close your round. If you get 10 different investors interested on 10 different weeks of the year, and by the time it goes over the next week, that first investor is not interested anymore, but you got a new one, you're very unlikely to close your round. Your chances of closing your round are, are basically zero. So running a tight process turns out to be the most important thing that entrepreneurs can do. And unfortunately, most entrepreneurs, when they start off doing this, they don't realize that. Like, I know I didn't realize that. I kind of learned it just through doing that. Wow. If I concentrate all my investor meetings and all my investor interest on a very short period of time, 
and I make sure that I have a super compelling presentation and I go in and I just give it to everybody in a compressed period of time. And I say, we're only doing meetings these few weeks. And if you're interested, let me know because then we'll do due diligence and then we'll, we'll close. That's the kind of situation that signals to investors, hey, this is a deal I should pay attention to. And in the absence of that, the signal to investors is, hey, this is a deal I should probably pass on. Because the dynamics of being a venture investor or an angel are, I'm going to look at 100 companies, I'm going to dig in on five, and I'm going to invest in one. And so you've really got to be that one. And that one often looks the same to them. It often looks like, hey, there's other people that have realized this is a one and everyone's competing. And I'm probably not going to get in unless I really dig in. So you got to, I mean, the first thing is to get to certainty and change whatever you need to change in your business so that you are indeed extremely exciting and compelling and investable. And then once you've done that preparatory work to make yourself super compelling, then it's running a super tight process so that you can communicate in the right way to all the investors that you're talking to. And all of that is invisible to entrepreneurs when they start this process. They're like, Hey, I'm just going to call some investors and, you know, see what happens. You know, that, that's a great point. In fact, I think that's also true. Like for any exit strategy you have, it's, it kind of comes down to like the operations, yeah. right? Uh, when, when, when somebody kind of looks at the company and sees a very, um, I would say very difficult operating where it's kind of operating around one person. Sometimes they were the Jack, the Jack of all trades, master of none. They wear all the hats, uh, and without this one person. And I feel sometimes even large organizations are like this too. Corporate organizations have this same issue as well. This isn't just an entrepreneur issue. This is also a corporate America where, where you kind of lean on, you know, one person's expertise sometimes too much. And that tends to be the operations, <laughs> right? That, that is the impact, the entire operation. Now, those are some of the difficulties. What, what would you say, maybe, maybe going back to your case with, let's actually, maybe let's go back to Kendra, your, your first company. How did Kendara, you sell yeah. that? Yeah, well, it was, it was kind of a, a crazy situation because as we had, uh, I stepped down as CEO and we had uh, one, two, three, we had three CEOs in the period of like six months, which, you know, is not a good sign um, because obviously we had two, you know, two false starts. And, and so we were in a position where our CEO got sick. Uh, the business was, had some specific challenges it needed to overcome and it seemed like the best deal at the time, like the best option at the time would, would be to sell their business because we did have some compelling IP. Um, and so we ran a process and we found a few people who were interested and then, you know, we dug in with one, they dug in with us and then it ended up going through. So hundred percent agree that in selling a business, you need to have multiple buyers. It's like you sell, I think there's a, there's a sales saying that is to have one buyer is to have no buyers. And I think that's true in the realm of raising money and also selling companies. And actually, there's a there's a company called Quorum, uh, who my friend Mark Cleveland works for, who runs competitive processes for businesses that are that are selling for, for this reason, because you want to get as many buyers as you can, because then you get into a competitive situation and then you get the actual uh, market value reflected in the price. How does uh, an entrepreneur create a better value proposition, right? To kind of create that allure. For investors or for customers? For, for investors. For investors. Well, it's tricky because you, you want to stay authentic with what your vision is and what you actually want to build. And so you don't want to bend over backwards and say, like, if you want to build a $10 million company, but you need to say you're going to build a hundred million dollar company, you know, that's not a good trade because it's going to come out at the end of the day. There's going to be a mismatch in values and expectations there. So that said, I think thinking big, thinking like asking the question, what could I do with $10 million in venture capital? You know, what could be possible? And do I want to take this ride? Um, and the answer needs to be a resounding hell yes. And then and then I think it's like really selling the upside because the downside is always the same. The downside is they invest and they lose their, their entire investment. So they're always comparing. The downside doesn't change. Like you, 
it's static. So then you really got to, they're going to be comparing the downside to the upside. So you've got to make the upside so compelling uh, and sell the sizzle of the upside that it seems like a good uh, risk benefit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree. And you, you mentioned like kind of like the risk benefit um, because entrepreneurship is risky, right? Have there, has yeah. there ever been a moment, but you kind of mentioned it too, the importance of, you know, being truly, you have to truly believe in it, right. To kind of keep moving forward. But has there yeah. ever been a moment for you of self doubt? Yes. All the time. It's like, uh, creating a, a startup, like a venture backed technology startup for me was like a constant roller coaster. It's the experience of being on this roller coaster of one day, you know, one day we published this, this article got published and our app went viral and we became the number one app in the United States for a day. Oh, I wow. woke up and checked my phone oh. <laughs> and, and we were number one in the health category. And I was like, what? Uh, and I remember like running into the office and high-fiving everybody. Like, we're number one, <laughs> we're number one, you know? And then the next day, like some homeless person like smashed the window of our office and I had meetings that I had to deal with and it was freezing cold and like the heat broke in our building. And so all my employees were freezing and they couldn't work. And I had to send them home. And I was like, oh, this is the worst. Oh, like, wow. There's no, no facilities guy. Like I'm the facilities guy. There's no HR guy. I'm the HR guy, you know? we had like 10 people at that point. So it's a roller coaster and it's, there's totally moments of self doubt. And uh, I think it's Ben Horowitz in his book, the hard, but the hard thing about hard things. Uh, he defines a withio, which is, excuse my language. Uh, uh, we're fucked. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> and he says that. that every startup, every startup has at least a few withios. Those moments when you're like, you know, I just, I, I think it might be over. I don't know how there's any way we can get out of this. And we definitely had a couple of those at Kandara. Uh, and, you know, we made it through and you hear about these stories of, of some of the world's biggest companies. Uh, like I'm thinking of Tesla and Elon Musk tells the story of almost running out of money and raising that round that he needed on the last day, the last afternoon or the last day that he needed before they had to liquidate. Um, and so I think, you got to be ready for the Wiffios. And of course, like sometimes it actually is over and you got to say, well, you know, I learned a lesson and I'll do better next time. And I'm not going to make that particular mistake again. And sometimes it's totally out of your control. Like something happens with the market. We just enrolled our last cohort in March and uh, two weeks before our enrollment date, like our cutoff for applications, Silicon Valley bank went under and rocked the entire startup world. Everybody yeah. was freaked out and like, what's going to happen? Is this the end? Is this another 2008? Everybody got really scared to do anything. Um, and so it affected us, it affected us a lot. Um, and so stuff like that is totally out of stuff can happen. It's totally out of your control and you just got to be flexible and roll with it. Yeah. In fact, I think that's a great time to kind of tell folks that are listening of the importance of an exit strategy, truthfully, because you kind of mentioned it with your with your first company. Um, sometimes your CEO got sick. Sometimes it's it's life issues that make kind of force you to kind of get out of that game. It's not because you're wanting to, you're ready to. Sometimes something that happens in life. In fact, if you go back and listen to the former episode with Exit Strategy, uh, Jessica Fiakovic, she talks very much about that. A lot of the times, people have to exit their organization because of a of a life changing moment. Now, what what you you also kind of mentioned, um, you know having the wherewithal to kind of know when it's time to fold. Give some entrepreneurs advice that maybe are holding on a little too long. What, when can, when should they know? I think this is the hardest question to answer in entrepreneurship. It's, it's so hard because you got to check your belief, you know, take it back to first principles and check your belief and be like, all right, what do I believe to be true? What do I, Am I learning from the market? And, you know, is there a path forward to the vision that I see that I want to create? And if there is, then you should, oh, is there a path forward? And is it worth, is it going to be worth it to get there? And if the answers to those questions are yes, then I think keep going because it's like so many entrepreneurs quit. It's like you quit before you get over the next hill and then 
your destination is over the next hill, but you didn't know it because you couldn't see it from where you're standing. Uh, so I think a lot of people quit too early and a lot of people hold on and it's really hard to know which is which, but it really comes down to like, you know, we're here to play this game of life. And like, do you want to keep playing the game that you're playing? And do you see that, that winning the game is worth it? Um, and if, if it stops being worth it for a whole number of reasons, um, then either, you know, change your context and get back into a spirit of play, or, or maybe it is time to do something else. What would you say, if anything, is easy about being an entrepreneur? Uh, you get to do what you want, when you want. <laughs> <laughs> that feels pretty easy right there. <laughs> There's nobody telling you what to do. If you want to stay in bed all day, and blow off all your meetings, you know, you can do it. Um, what else is easy about being an entrepreneur? I mean, that's the main thing. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs for that reason, because they want that freedom. Also, I think creating, you know, you get to create stuff and try it out. Like it's, it's way easier to create something and try it out than in any other profession, probably. Um, and I love that. Like, I love coming up with new ideas for products or services, and then just on the fly, like testing them out with our founders and seeing if, seeing if they love them, seeing if they provide value or not. That's, that's a great part about being an entrepreneur for me. Now, what advice would you have for aspiring entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs, folks that are currently in the entrepreneurial world? Aspiring entrepreneurs is just, you got to do it. You know, I, uh, sometimes I come across people that are like, ah, I want to start a business, but I don't know, you know, just try it. You can always go back to having a job. There's no, you're not really risking anything. People think I'm going to lose my career and I'm never going to be able to come. No, you only lose your career after you've been doing it for like, 15 or 20 years, I think. And then at some point you're like unemployable and you're just an entrepreneur. <laughs> you got to be an entrepreneur. Uh, but if you want to just jump in and do it for a year and see what it's like, you're not really risking anything. You can always go back. Everyone will take you back. You're like, yeah, I tried to start my whatever company and decided it wasn't for me. People will take you back and you'll probably come back at a higher salary because you now have that entrepreneurial experience. Um, for current entrepreneurs, I have some advice would be, you know, if you're just starting out, your only goal is to find product market fit. You don't need to hire people or spend a lot of money on lawyers or formation or really anything until you've figured out, do I have something that people love and that they're willing to pay, pay for? Um, and then once you have product market fit, that, that's like a momentous occasion in the story of every company because now you have a business. Before you have product market fit, you don't have a business. Even if you have 20 employees, $5 million of venture capital in the bank and an office and a nice logo and everyone's got t-shirts and nice couches and meeting rooms or whatever, if you don't have product market fit, from my perspective, you don't have a business. Um, but once you get product market fit, now you have a business because you've unlocked value. You found a way to produce value in the world that didn't exist previously, where people are paying you $5, but they're getting $50 of value. Um, so once you get to that point, now things change because now you have a business and now you get to get to go on the adventure of actually building an organization that's going to deliver that value ongoingly. And so I see it as these, these two phases, like before product market fit, after product market fit. And if you think you have product market fit, but you don't, you're just going to scale up and run out of money. Um, so I think that's a, that's a key distinction that I want people to be thinking about. No, that, that's a great point. In fact, I'm reading this book right now, uh, Playing to Win. Uh, it's the marketing book, Marketing Strategy. And oh, it's talking cool. about Oriel, the, the, the brand, the face product brand, right? Back in the past, uh, you know, they had its own by um, Procter & Gamble, I believe it is. And, and so back in the past, you know, there was kind of an older you know, woman's kind of brand, 55 and older. Uh, they were in the targets and the Walmarts of the world, but they didn't feel like they had the right target market because their product, other products that were next to them could sell for $50 a bottle, but they're, they're at the Macy's, right? And so they kind of restructured and rebranded uh, and they kind of removed the Revlon Oriel and I think it just became Oriel. They made the sleeker bottle, uh, kind of up their up their uh, ingredients, you know, made it a little more fancier, and now you're starting to see them being able to sell their products at like ninety dollars. To your point, 
they created value, right? They, yeah. they essentially remarketed themselves being healthier and folks that are, and, and interesting enough too, they also did a, a, a cost analysis. And so they originally marketed it. It's like, okay, they saw that it sell, sold very well at twelve ninety nine. It didn't sell well at fifteen ninety nine, and it sold great at eighteen ninety nine. Right. Because there was this, uh, you know, f- you know, just general in your in your mind, the folks again at, at the targets of the world were willing to say, okay, I can, I'll buy it at eight ninety nine, but the Macy's of the world weren't, right. But then you had the folks at fifteen ninety nine. It was still too cheap for the Macy's of the world. Now too expensive for the targets of the world. But the right. eighteen ninety nine was perfect because it felt like the target folks were like, oh, I'm getting a very high class, high quality product. Where the Macy folks of the world, like I'm actually getting a very good product for a very good price. You know, it's and yeah. It's, pricing is so weird. It's that way. so crazy. It's so <laughs> crazy. And I love reading this books and, and, and interviewing folks like you, just because. And I hope folks that are listening are also taking note and truly writing this information down because this is free knowledge uh, that we're we're trying to provide for you. Um, but it's also an opportunity to really learn what it takes to succeed. Because as you mentioned earlier as well. You don't have to quit your job. I've been doing the entrepreneurship route for about two and a half years now. I still have a career in healthcare. I'm still focused in the healthcare world. Just started a nonprofit, still running the podcast. Still, We still got a lot of things going, but it's kind of like learning all these skills throughout this process have also actually benefited me in my you know professional career as well, to your point, right? Uh, sometimes you can leave and come back and get paid more, or you can stay and get paid more hopefully as well right who knows yeah now yeah. what what where can folks find you where where are you at online uh you can find me fulcrum venture accelerator.com so if you just uh google fulcrum venture accelerator you know you'll find us uh we're on we just started an instagram so i think our handle is the fulcrum hq uh, you can find us on youtube We've got a bunch of videos on there about how to build a company how to raise money um, but yeah, that's the best place to find me. Perfect. Just Google Fulcrum, Fulcrum Venture Accelerator and you'll find us. Or folks that are listening, another great way to find this information is to subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. Nice little great time to plug that. Go ahead and visit the shades of e.com and you can subscribe to the newsletter there. We will have Will's information as well as Fulcrum information on there as well on the website. So after this episode airs, we'll have a transcription of this episode Will, thank you so much for your time. Very informative and educational. Uh, I really do think that you provide a lot of great insight for entrepreneurs. You have a lot of great uh, experience in the venture capital world as well. And I'm, I'm love to chat with you after the show, uh, see, what, see what else we can kind of work together with. So those folks that listen at home, please visit me at theshadesofe.com. You can also follow at the Shades of E on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.